I was praying about what God wanted to say at the beginning of the year. And I woke up at 4 a.m. and my phone went off and I got a text. And the text was from a number of someone I didn't even know who they were. And obviously it was someone that I, we had had, you know, a conversation in the past or whatever, but for somehow I'd lost the contact, so I didn't know who it was. But on the, the text message, it was someone saying, God spoke to me, and I feel like I have a prophetic message from God for you. And they began to share some things, and, but in the message, here's what they said. The thing that really stuck out to me was they said this, now is the time to go straight ahead and not look back, for God is with you. Now you know why it kind of felt like what we just sang a moment ago. Leaving the past behind. God said through this message, Jared, I'm calling you to go forward and not look back because I'm leading you. And so I got up, I began to pray and meditate on this word, began to test the word. The Bible says that when you receive something from the prophets, that the, the message should be tested. Does it line up with scripture? Is this um, line up with the season and what God is saying? And so I tested the word and in my time of prayer, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, it was from God and the message for you and higher vision is advance in 2020. So I looked up the word advance, and here's what the word advance means. It means to move forward in a purposeful way to cause to progress. Come ask the question, how many of you want to make some progress this year? You're tired of staying where you are. You're tired of being stuck in the condition you're in. You're tired of things staying the way they've always been. You're ready to advance and to progress with intention. A lot of us, we are on, we're moving, but we're moving randomly. Some of us are moving backwards. Some of us are moving sideways. God wants you to move forward. In fact, can I tell you that the scripture says in Matthew, Jesus said this. He said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and the violent take it by force. In other words, sometimes it's not just going to come to you. You're going to have to move forward. You're going to have to go after it. You're going to have to possess it. So if the kingdom is moving forward, don't stay where you are. Advance with what God is doing. Anybody ready to advance this year? So that's the heart. That's the spirit of what we're talking about. So I've used a story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it's a story about how the, a group of people, the Edomites, decided to attack the people of God in the nation of Israel. This happened thousands of years ago. And when that news came that uh, this massive army was coming against them, the king, Jehoshaphat, he called the people together and they began to pray. And through that process of prayer, God gave them some wisdom, some direction. They got the army together. They got the worshipers together. And the Bible said that as soon as they, as they began to worship and began to walk towards the enemy, as they began advancing... God supernaturally caused the enemy to start fighting and killing each other. And the enemy was defeated without a shot being fired, without a sword being raised, because God fought the battle. In fact, that was the prophetic word, which we're going to talk about next week, um, 2 Chronicles 2020. Come on, anybody want some 2020 vision? We're going to look at 2 Chronicles 2020, where he got a word and he said, God is going to fight the battle for you. How many are thankful that God's fighting for us? So today, I want to carry on what we learned last week. In fact, I didn't finish my, my message last week, and I'm going to carry it into this week. So I'm going to give you a quick review. Last week, we learned that if we're going to advance through this story, we learned that the first way is that we have to advance through prayer. Prayer is a tool, a technique that God wants to use to cause you to prog make progress spiritually, relationally, financially in your life in every way. And we learned there were three ways if we're going to be people of prayer, here's how we pray. Number one, we remember when we pray. And that is that in the story, the king stood up and prayed and he began to call to remembrance some big things that God had done, how he brought them into the promised land. Can I tell you that we all have experienced God's power? If you're here today, most of you, how many would say, yes, I can think of some awesome things God has done in my life. So when you pray, don't just pray and check off the list but go into your prayer time remembering and reminding God, hey God, remember the time when you came and you saved me from my sin. Remember the time when you healed me when I was sick. It'll cause faith to rise in your heart. 
so that you can advance. The second thing is when you're praying is fast when you pray. Jesus said there are some things that will not break free without prayer and fasting. They were trying to set someone free from a demonic spirit and they couldn't do it. And Jesus said the reason is some things only change with prayer and fasting. There are some breakthroughs that may not happen until you fast and pray. And that's why we're in a season of fasting and prayer. Y'all still with me? Then we learned last week, lastly, that you need to walk and pray. And we learned about Enoch, how he walked in fellowship with God. Prayer's not about being a monologue, it's about a dialogue, a conversation where we speak to God and God speaks to us. And we have relationship with him and we walk and pray, meaning that we bring God's presence, God's purpose into our day, wherever we go, on the job, in our home, in mealtime. We bring God into the journey. Prayer is not something that's separated. Prayer is not the last resort. Prayer is the first response. It's how we begin the day, and then we invite God in the journey. And so I want to continue on with another principle. I'm going to give you two principles about prayer, because we need to advance through prayer. So if you're taking notes, those that are online right now, I want you to write this down. You can also go to the app and look at the notes there. Here we go. How do we advance through prayer? Here's the point today. We watch when we pray. Another principle about prayer, if you're going to be a person of prayer, is watch and pray. Now, some of you are like, what does that mean? Does that mean I keep my eyes open? In fact, I have a funny story about that. Um, when my kids were little, I remember that uh, we would, you know, have these little moments of prayer, sometimes at meals, sometimes before they go to bed. You know, every time before they go to bed, we'd pray. And I remember one time when the girls were really small, they were, they were in, you know, in bed, and I sat down with them. I said, okay, we're going to pray. Now close your eyes. How many know it's, you know, kids close their eyes for just a little while, but they want to open them so bad. And so they close their eyes. I'm holding their little hands, and my eyes are open because I'm watching them, and I start praying. And as I start praying, one of them, I don't know if it was, I think it was Macy, she like opened her eyes. She's like, dad, you're cheating. Your eyes are open. And then I looked at her, and I said, honey, it's okay because the Bible tells us to watch and pray. And she's like, what? I don't understand. And, you know, it was kind of funny. And then we went on. Watch and pray. Did you know that that is actually in the Bible? To watch when you pray. In fact, let's go to the story and I'll show you kind of the idea. And it says this. It says that they got the army. They started walking and they're praying as they're walking. They're worshiping as they're walking. And the Bible said when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see, not a single one of the enemy had escaped. When I read this passage and I was just meditating on it, I, I kind of got this image of them walking, praying, and watching. And then I noticed at one point they actually stopped to actually just look and see. I want to get a perspective from this vantage point as we're in this process of prayer and advancing in God's kingdom. I want to see and I want to tell you that this is not, you know, just, in fact, some of you might be saying, well, Pastor Jared, again, you're extrapolating quite a bit from an Old Testament story of what happened in the Bible. No, I want to show you that this principle is, is throughout the Bible. Let's go to the New Testament, because in Colossians, I want you to see what it says. Guys, if you'll bring that up. Colossians tells us this. It says, continue in, what's the word? Prayer, Prayer and what? Watch. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. Watch and Pray. Pray and watch with thanksgiving. The word continue in prayer, it's a Greek word, and let me tell you what this Greek word means. It means to be devoted to and persistent in. So in other words, when you pray, don't just pray and then if things get bad, you quit praying. Be devoted and persistent in the process of prayer. Don't just do it one time and forget about it. Be continual. Keep doing it persist at it and then it says persist in prayer and watch and the word watch there is a Greek word which means to be alert and awake so persist in your prayers keep praying be devoted to it no matter what's going on in life I'm devoted I'm committed to consistently pray continually pray and as I do it I'm going to be alert and paying attention and watchful with a heart of thanksgiving. Uh, let me just kind of explain it this way. Um, you know, I, I have some things that I really love that are up there on the top of my list. Obviously, the most important thing, hopefully as Christians, all of us should have this as the top of our list. How many think God should be up there on the, on the top of the list? I love God. 
And, I, you know, r- a close, razor-thin second is obviously my family. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love them. But, you know, there's something else that's way up there on my list in prayer. Or, I'm sorry, way up there on my list in priorities. And you know what it is? GPS. <laughs> Come on, how many love GPS. Now, that's mostly the older crowd, because the younger crowd, you millennials, you just don't get it. Remember back in the day when we had maps? Come on, remember when we had maps, and you would have to go to a phone to try to call, hey, I'm coming to this place, and, and the map says I go here, but come on, how many of you that used to use maps, you love GPS? Come on. I mean, GPS is awesome, right? Because you're driving along and it tells you where to go. I mean, when you're going into LA and you're trying to find some hole-in-the-wall place and it's telling you, turn right, turn left, you love GPS. The The thing is, is that with GPS, what it does is it tries to alert you before you need to make a turn. And the problem is with me, sometimes I'm, I'm too far over in the lane, in the wrong lane, and can't get over and I miss my turn. Anybody ever had that happen to you? And then you're mad at everybody else, right? Because you're in the wrong lane. Okay, just throwing that out there. Um, but you know what? I found something else that I love as much as GPS. And actually, I recently got a gift for my 50th birthday. And when I got it, it was an Apple Watch. Do we have any Apple Watches in the room? Come on, lift your hand. Any Apple Watches? Come on, anybody like your Apple Watch? Let me tell you why I love my Apple Watch. Not because it tells me what time it is and not just because like if I have a text, I see it right there. Not because if my phone isn't with me and my phone rings, I can still answer it on my watch. I mean, I could go through a lot of reasons. But let me tell you why I love it. I didn't know it did this until I was on my way to my first location. I hit GPS. I'm on the way. And then I'm supposed to turn in 500 yards. And sometimes the GPS tells you and sometimes it doesn't. But suddenly, as I'm getting close to my turn my wrist starts buzzing. And at first I was like, what's wrong with this watch? And then as I went along, every time I got to a new place where I needed to make a turn, my wrist would buzz. My watch would buzz to say, hey, get ready. Be alert. Because something's getting ready to happen. And that's kind of what The scripture is saying when it says, as you pray with persistence, I want you to pray in a way where you're watching with a faithful, faith-filled heart, having this mindset that I am confident in this, that I am going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I prayed about a miracle, and you know what? I'm waiting for my miracle to come. I'm watching for my miracle to come. You know what? God just might be ready to do something around the corner. I could just be about to come to my location where God's going to do the miracle that I'm praying for. When was the last time you were watching and waiting for God's divine intervention in your circumstances? The Bible says watch and pray. I think there's two reasons. One is because God wants us to be faith-filled, ready to receive the miracle that he has waiting for us. I think there's another reason. I was meditating on this, and the Lord reminded me of when Jesus said, like I said to my daughter Macy, watch and pray. Jesus was in a very stressful moment. He was about ready to go to the cross. And so he goes into the Garden of Eden. So now picture this. Him and his three good friends, Peter, James, and John, he says, I want you to come and pray with me. And as they go into this dark, in the middle of the night, garden, there's no light out there. They get out there in the middle of this garden, and and so Jesus says, listen, my heart is heavy. I I have a tremendous burden. They don't realize that Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. So he says, pray with me, and they're like, okay, we got you, Jesus. We got you back. And so he walks off a little ways to pray, and he's so heavy with the burden and the stress of what's what's about to take place in his life that he literally starts sweating blood. And some of you say, that's crazy. Is that even true? Yes, we know that in history, there are actually conditions that doctors have seen in very extreme rare situations where people become so stressed that capillaries begin to burst and blood gets into their system. And when they sweat, they actually sweat blood. But it has to be severe, extreme stress. How many know Jesus had some pretty major stress? He is about to carry the sins of the world. Come on, how many know that's stress? And so as he's praying, he tells them before he goes to pray, he says, now guys, I'm under a heavy burden right now. Watch and pray with me. And so they say, okay. So he goes and prays. Well, then as he's praying, he's trying to focus on his prayers, but he keeps getting interrupted with this. 
And he walks over and his friends are asleep. So he kicks him. He says, wake up. And here's what he says. Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'm like, sorry, Jesus, we're just tired. We're, you know, it's been a lot. There's lots going on right now, but we got you, we got you, we're with you. And so then he goes back over and they fall asleep again. He comes back over. By this time, God showed up and the angels have ministered to him. He's ready and he walks over and he says, wake up. I told you to watch and pray. But nevertheless, now comes my accuser, my betrayer. And, and then Jesus, Judas walks up and kisses him on the cheek. And we know that, that they rest Jesus and then the disciples run in fear and betray Jesus. As I began to meditate on this passage, I began to think, Jesus, why? Because many times when Jesus would give things to the disciples, he wasn't just saying it to them. He was saying it to you and me. And I began to realize, what was he saying? And, and I believe that the reason Jesus said, watch and pray, is he said, because you'll fall into temptation. Because here's what's interesting. is had they been watching, if they'd have been praying and they'd been alert, they would have seen the betrayer coming at least a mile or a half a mile away. They were in the midst of darkness and there was a mob of, of soldiers and people coming with torches in the middle of a dark garden and they would have seen what the enemy was planning before the enemy even got there. And could it be that one of the reasons why Jesus said, I want you to watch and pray is because sometimes it's not just to have a heart ready to receive God's promises. It's that we would, we would actually do what the scripture says, which is there's an enemy. So be sober and alert and mindful and watchful because he's an adversary that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a roaring lion that will come after you. So stay alert. Could it be that a lot of us end up being kissed on the cheek by the enemy and facing struggles and trials? that maybe we may not have had to experience because we weren't willing to watch and pray. Come on, y'all with me. Now, theologically, Jesus would have gone to the cross and been arrested either way, even if they had watched and prayed. But I think he was trying to give us a principle that is the flesh is weak. And, it, and, and you're going to fall into some things that you don't have to fall into. If you watch and pray. What would happen with the enemy's strategies for your kids this year if you watched and pray? You know, um, I'll end with this. So many times, I think God wants to do things. He wants to protect us. He wants to bless us. But if we're not careful, we're not watching. It reminds me of a story, and it's a, it's a fictitious kind of funny story about this man who... Um, there was a, a flood that hit his city and so it got to his house and it was so high and strong that he had to climb up on the roof. And as he was standing on the roof, he cries out to God. He says, God, save me from the flood. And then suddenly a boat comes up and it says, hey, I was going by it. I saw you on your roof. Why don't you jump in and I'll take you to, land, you know, take you to safety. He said, no, 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 God's going to save me. So the boat takes off. And then suddenly a helicopter comes flying by and it flies down and it drops one of those ladders, rope ladders, and it says, hey, grab the rope, or the rope ladder, I'll take you to safety. And he says, no, no, I'm good. God's going to save me. And says, all right, whatever, dude. And so he flies away. <laughs> and then a jet ski comes by. The jet ski comes zooming up and says, hey, I have my jet ski. Hop on, dude, I'll take you to safety. He's like, no, no, dude, it's okay. God's going to save me. And so the guy goes off and then suddenly the dam breaks and the man is washed away and killed in the flood and he gets to heaven he says God what happened I thought you were going to save me he said yeah man what's wrong I sent you a boat and a helicopter and a jet ski how many of us may have missed our jet ski or our helicopter because we were distracted discouraged rather than watching and pray. You want to advance? Everybody say it with me. Watch and pray. Let's try it one more time. Come on, all of you in Texas and Washington, say it with me. Watch and pray. I want to give you the, the last prayer principle, and we're going to go to a whole new theme next week, the next few weeks. Not only do you need to remember in prayer, 
Not only do you need to fast and pray, walk and pray, watch and pray. Here's the last one. Circle up when you pray. Circle up when you pray. Now, I know as soon as I brought that up, some of you are like, I knew it. I knew Pastor Jerry was going to do one of those circle points again. Every time the new circles start, and it's the beginning of the year, the next thing you know, he's preaching on circles. Well, let me just stop and say, you're right, because I love circles. And you know what's interesting is I don't have to come up with a way to talk about them. What's interesting is I believe circles are so valuable. Relationship and community with other Christians is so valuable. What's interesting is everywhere I get in the Bible, I find it. And once again, as I'm talking about prayer and about advancing, guess what shows up in the middle of our passage? Let's go back to the beginning of the, the chapter when we go into Second Chronicles. Guys, if you'll bring that up. It says, as, everybody say as, all of the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and wives and children. In other words, as they circled up. Now, this was a big prayer circle in this particular gathering. But as they circled in prayer, watch what happens. The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. As if you bring up the next verse. His name was Jehaziel. I had to say that several times to learn it, so since I had to practice it, I'm going to make you practice it too, okay? So let's all say it together, Jehaziel. The Spirit of God shows up on this man named Jehaziel. He ends up praying and prophesying, and here's what he said. He said, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty, mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. How many are thankful that God's, got a, God's fighting for us? In fact, he goes on, and we're going to learn next week, he talks about it. He says, you're not even going to have to fight in this battle. God's going to fight for you because this battle belongs to the Lord. Can I stop and say, if you're in a battle right now, it's not your battle, it's God's battle. And he's with you, and he's fighting for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. What I find interesting is that there's two things that really jumped out at me when I, when I, I looked at this, this idea. The first thing was simply this, is that God's presence showed up when they circled up. God's presence showed up when they circled up. Now, that, that's not to say that if you're by yourself praying that God's presence isn't, with, presence isn't with you. I want to bring some context and some balance. The Bible says that when you receive Christ, his spirit indwells or he fills you with his spirit. So you have God's presence with you when you're by yourself somewhere praying because God is omnipresent. His spirit indwells believers. So God is with you. But we see it over and over and over again in the Bible that when people gather together, not just gather together for football or gather together for uh, you know something else when they gather together around the name of Jesus when they gather together around uh, worshiping and loving God that God shows up in a powerful and in a profound way in fact I want to show you something that I think is a beautiful picture of this because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of people who are circled up in prayer and worship he literally sits down his presence is there Pastor Chad this week posted a picture. And this picture was something that happened a year ago after. It's never happened in the, in fact, in the 14 years. We're getting ready to hit 15 years as an anniversary for our church. And in the almost 15 years, this has never happened before, but last year after one of our early morning prayer gatherings, everybody got done praying and everybody left and Pastor Chad walked into the auditorium and when he walked in, this is what he saw. Let's show the other picture. There was a cloud. And so he took a picture of it and he just took a moment and he began to worship God. And, and now let me just stop and say, now I know some of you here are very intellectual and very um, analytical. Come on, how many analytical people do we have in the room? Wait, wait. Most of our analytical people would not raise their hand because they're thinking about it right now. <laughs> they're like, wait a minute, should I do this? What, what's the benefit and what is the... I only going to think it through. Listen, I'm analytical, so I get it. And, and so when you first see something like that, here's what you might say. Well, it's well, obvious, Pastor Jared. The church has one of those kind of haze machines. And so during the service, when it was done, you know, there was maybe because the, possibly when everyone left, there's more body heat. When the body heat left, 
you walk, you know, then the room cools down because the room cools down. When there's haze, it drops. You know, I, I don't understand necessarily how it all came together in one little area, but it, it's possible that it was just haze. Now, let me just stop and say that is possible. In fact, it's a logical explanation. And some of you even say, Pastor, why do we even have haze? What, 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 what are you trying to be like, you know, some rock show or some concert or like a club? What are we doing? Well, let me just tell you first a minute. The reason any, any uh, uh, you know, place that's using lighting will use haze or fog. And here's why. Not because it's just, it's cool, but because the lights can't do what they're called to do without haze. Let me explain. As a church, one of the things we want to do is we want people to use their gifts and talents to worship and honor God. And so how cool is it that someone that has a gift for creativity with lighting is able to, in the middle of a song about the blood of Jesus, cause the lights to turn red and, and cause the screen to do that. And suddenly you see a beam of light and people that are in the audience, as they're thinking about the blood of Jesus, they start to see these red lights and think about the blood of Jesus and how it cleanses us from sin. And now you don't just think about the blood of Jesus from an intellectual perspective. You somehow, for those that are creative, connect with it and start, you start thinking. You're allowing people to use their gifts. People are connecting with God in a creative way. You see, you would never see the beam of light if there wasn't haze. So haze isn't about trying to create some sense of God's glory, or be like the world, it's to allow the lights to do what they're supposed to do. Y'all, y'all following me? Yeah. So it's possible, kind of, I, that was, that was, I just took a bunny trail, but I just hopped back on. So y'all with me? All right. It's possible that that was just haze that came together in a unique situation. But at the same time, what I think is that it's a reminder to me, whether it's a natural occurrence or a supernatural manifestation, what it should do is remind us that the Bible says, Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, I also tell you this, that if two or three agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it. And then he goes on to say in the next verse, for where two or three gather together in my name or as my followers, I am there among you. It should remind us that when they dedicated the temple, that the temple actually was filled with a cloud and they couldn't continue to minister. You see that picture and that verse and this story is to remind you of something that when you get together and you gather in a place like Higher Vision Church and you lift up your hands or you get together with some believers and you start to encourage each other and pray for each other, you're not just checking off a, a religious box and getting your religious duties done for the week. You're standing in the presence of Almighty God and He is with you and you are not alone and His presence is there to guide you and to heal you and to set you free. God is in the middle. His presence is in the middle of people who circle up and pray. And I've seen that happen where there was no haze. In high school, I went to a youth camp and we were worshiping and suddenly there was a cloud in the middle of the auditorium. I'll never forget it. And I hope that you never forget seeing that picture that every time you grab somebody's hand and you begin to pray that you are not alone. You have the manifest, powerful presence of God walking with you in everything you face in life. Come on, how many are thankful for the presence of God? I'm going to end with this. When I read that passage about the fact that he gathered them up in a circle and they began to pray. And then it says this, we just read it, that the Holy Spirit fell. And that's where we talked about God's presence, but it said it fell on Jehaziel. As I was meditating on this passage, I'm like, God, what is that saying? And what are you saying through this passage? And it kept drawing me back to circles because what we read a moment ago, what Jesus said is that when you circle up, I, do, I, I answer prayers, I do miraculous things, and I show up. Let me just say it this way. When you circle up, God shows up and shows off. When you circle up, He shows up and He shows, shows off. But something else can also happen in that setting because in this circle, in the story in Chronicles, there was a man that needed some answers. And maybe you're here and you need answers. You need answers about what am I going to do with 
my, my, my business this next year? What am I going to do in this situation with schooling? What, what, what am I supposed to do? What is my major? What classes am I supposed to take? Is this the person, God, that I'm supposed to marry? Lord, what do I do with that wayward child? Some of us need answers, and we don't know what those answers are. And Jehaz, uh, uh, Jehoshaphat showed up in this circle, and he needed an answer. And the answer was, God, how do I face this battle? What do I do when this enemy is attacking me? How do I advance forward? point is he didn't have what he needed and as I began to meditate on this passage what I discovered is that when he was willing to get out of his isolation and commit to being in a circle of prayer and worship here's what's interesting God gave him the answer through somebody else The answer that he needed was in the circle. There are people, as the scriptures say, the plans, many are the plans of people, but they fail or for lack of counselors. The point is, is that it may be that that prophetic direction that you need for your life is going to come through somebody else, but you'll never get it through somebody else if you're not in a circle with somebody else. He got what he needed in his circle. And it came through this man named Jehaziel. Jehaziel, by the way, I did some research on him. And he was um, in a genealogical line of a man by the name of Asaph. Asaph was a Levite, which means that Jehaziel was a Levite. And let me just tell you a little bit about the Levites. First of all, in general, Levites were like, kind of like a modern day, they were uh, you know, paid by the church or by the, the house of God back in those days. They were given to the, the church by God, the, the, the tribe of Levite, to the priests to help do the work of the ministry. So the Levites, they would do all the things that were required. They were the ushers. They were the greeters. They would clean the, the bowls and the spoons and the forks that, for the, the, the utensils that were used in sacrifices. They would take the tent down and set it back up. Guess what? We got a bunch of Levites every Sunday morning that show up and set up the tent in the tabernacle over at Canyon Country. They put up the signs and they set up the PA system. They were servants in the house of the Lord. So number one, there was a servant in the house of the Lord the, of the lineage of Asaph. Secondly, not only was Asaph a Levite, but he was appointed by David to be in the presence of God, to be around the Ark of the Covenant, to worship and to release prophetic songs to minister unto the Lord. So this was a person who served in the church, worshipped in the church, ministered on behalf of the Lord, hearing God's voice. This wasn't just anybody. And, and, and what, what it began to remind me of is I thought of how many people need answers in their life how many people are waiting for direction in their life and so what we do is we grab that self-help book or or we turn on that oprah winfrey program to, to hear what they have to say about what we're going through and and we go through google and we do all our research and we we go in and we find out and we read article after article, article and after article listen there's nothing wrong with the self-help book there's nothing wrong with the television program or there's nothing wrong with google but i'm going to tell you there just might be answers and power and freedom that you'll never receive if you stay by yourself I'm praying that God is going to break that mindset off of you to say God I'm getting in a circle because let me tell you your answer your prophetic word your promise might be waiting for you in your circle but the devil fights hard no no I don't need that I'm too busy I got hurt one time I can't find anybody that I connect with. And I'm telling you, the devil will use lie after lie after lie after lie to keep you alone. But what this is teaching us is that the key to the release of God's power, presence, and divine direction is found when you circle up yeah. in prayer. So I want to read to you as we end this. Come on, y'all still with me? Say amen. I had Pastor Anthony send me a testimony. This was someone who 
believed in God, considered himself a Christian, but wasn't really walking with the Lord the way they should, doing it on their own. And I want to hear you, hear, I want you to hear today what happened when they said, okay, I'm going to circle up in prayer. I was in a place in my life where I had hit rock bottom. I had been fired from a great job, had lost all connection I had with God, and had lived for years abusing my body, partaking in drugs, and using alcohol excessively. I was a 35-year-old single woman living with my parents, hating myself and everyone around me, who had found successful relationships. I had no Christian girlfriends and was beyond lost in this world. Praise God, I found a circle. I found a woman's group by chance and knew from the first night that group was exactly where I wanted to be. I heard stories similar to mine that night and the healing that they had experienced. And I thought to myself, wow, does this mean I can actually be forgiven? Does this mean I could forgive myself and get past my shame and constant guilt? I continued to go weekly and became eventually very comfortable sharing with my new sisters in Christ. Now, eight seasons later, and a lot of hard work, constant support from the leader in my group. I'm a new person. I live my life for the Lord and have been out of sexual sin for three years and have my dream job that only Jesus could have provided. I can honestly say that this circle group saved my life and I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't found it. Circling up with other sisters in Christ, just trying to make it through this tough world was the best decision I ever made. Anytime I need a sister, I have one. Anytime I need a prayer, I have 20 girls who will pray with me. Trusting others in God to help me made me a new woman, totally renewed in Christ, and I couldn't be more thankful to my girls and to the leader of this group. And as I received this testimony, I just thought, how many people are like this woman and you're getting ready to go into 2019 and 2019 is going to be exactly like it was in 2018. In fact, it may be worse as long as you say, I got this on my own. And I want to tell you what Jesus is saying today is that, listen, I want to show up and I want to show off. I want to get you out of your brokenness. I want to get you out of your stagnation. I want you to progress, to move forward with intention and purpose. I want to take you from glory to glory and strength to strength. I want you to experience not life, but abundant life. I want you to experience the promises that I have for you. Promises of a hope and of a future. Promises to prosper you and not to harm you but you see God can't do what you're unwilling to allow him to do if you stay isolated and all alone and on your own and why I'm here today is to challenge you get out of your brokenness get on your feet don't step back don't stand still but take a step forward advance 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 oh what God has waited for you.